we are looking for the restrictions such as face coverings and social distancing to remain on public transport. Uh, can, I, can I say it was 50,000 infections, not, not, not deaths, which is a very big different, difference there. Um, I think you may be confusing correlation and causation there in terms of whether masks were the big difference. Of course, there were massive changes uh, in, in the early months. We had people very tragically who were dying in many different walks of life, a lot of those who were, who were you know, facing the public. We didn't see, for, interestingly, uh, a higher death toll among people working in supermarkets who were throughout the pandemic uh, coming to face-to-face with customers long before uh, face masks were the norm uh, and it's thought there may be a number of other reasons that may have played their role in why uh, uh, transport workers uh, sadly had a higher uh, death toll early on um, if, if if transport workers are able to socially distance still and, and it may well be that that would be the case I mean certainly if you're a tube driver I'm not quite sure what, what, what contact you're having with the public on a daily basis any more than anyone else in a job. In fact, I would have thought less. Um, uh, many staff, certainly, you know, I get on, I get public transport every single day and, and they've got, you know, cordons around them so they don't come close to, to too many people every day. Most people probably don't come in contact with that many people in the same way they do. Um, then why would it be necessary for them to only come into contact with masked, pe- masked passengers? Well, well, I, I did start by talking about drivers, but of course, mm. like, like yourself, I use public transport and was delighted when the social distancing was introduced and the masks as well, more for the safety of the passengers. Um, now, I, I'm, I'm just repeating myself now, those restrictions are going to disappear. I would feel extremely uncomfortable if I were on a bus sitting next to someone in the rush hour um, in in a very contracted space where people didn't wear masks, I would Why? I wouldn't be comfortable. I, I would leave. I would leave the Why? The, the bus. Why? Mm-hmm. But, well, well, because it, it it's been proved. Um, let me see. Chris Whitty said last night that we have to reduce transmission and spread. Mm-hmm. That's the idea of the face masks. And, you reduce well, the transmission. I, I don't even. There's an extraordinarily <laughs> Big big hole in the face mask uh, evidence. Um, we've seen in America, North Dakota, South Dakota, two different states. You know, it's the same part of the world, same culture, same everything. Um, one half, one half the uh, had uh, well, one state had uh, ended up the uh, mask mandated ruling. One, one half didn't. We actually saw cases go down uh, faster in the state which didn't have mask. We've seen Florida, Texas open up for months now uh, without mask. There's never been a a country or a US state where you can see the point or indeed a, in Germany and different part, different regions where you can see the point on the graph aha that's when they brought in the mask mandate that's when cases went down or that's when they ended the mask mandate that's when cases went up there's very 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 scant evidence they make any real difference whatsoever in the real world and certainly not when they're used in the way that we use them now which is someone just pulling a little bit of cloth over their face very loose those pale pale blue masks that people put on uh, used again and again there's very little evidence they make any difference whatsoever. If they did, you would see that on the data. You would see it on the graphs, and it's not there. Sajid Javi, the Health Secretary. Let's speak with Dr Ross Jones, retired paediatrician, part of the Heart Organisation, and Julian Tang, consultant virologist at the Leicester Royal Infirmary. Ross Jones, firstly, afternoon to you. Has Boris Johnson got this right? Good afternoon. Yes, he absolutely has got it right, and particularly that clip you've just played from Sajid Javid. I have to say, when we heard he was going to be the new health secretary, my heart lifted. I thought, here is a man who might look at the whole picture. That is what's been so lacking right from the beginning, this total monofocus on one disease and one disease only. Um, and you know, his point about health care of all aspects, mental health in particular, uh, cancer care. I'm a, a retired pediatrician. We've seen children admitted with diabetic Uh, coma because they've been too frightened to come early who normally would have just come and been treated as an outpatient and never been admitted at all Um, and I think there have been a lot of concerns from the Royal College of Pediatrics about children who of course have been barely affected by Covid at all but have been worse affected by other neglected conditions. Let's speak with uh, Julian Tang as well. Julian afternoon to you. Same question. Has Boris Johnson got this right? Okay so um, Dr Jones and I aren't just going on on the same, that kind of area. I mean, I'm a general physician, so I have MRCP. The problem is that if you don't control the virus, as we know, it has a knock-on effect on everything else, including the care of other uh, medical conditions, as well as the economy 
and uh, the mental health of the population. So let's say that we don't um, have any restrictions and then you see a winter flu double whammy with flu and COVID coming in and diluting the workforce who are actually looking after all the other non-COVID related medical conditions. I think that will be a tax a taxation on the NHS capability as well. And that's what we're trying to prevent, to prevent the admissions to hospital of COVID related patients and flu related patients, hopefully, uh, to let those other medical problems be dealt with. So you would be in favour of retaining what social distancing, masks, that kind of thing? So the main thing I would say is uh, at least voluntary uh, indoor masking, because social distancing is very variable. If you go to a supermarket, there's hardly any. You can see people can step between trolleys and the aisles. But masking, you can protect. You can use yourself to protect yourself as well as protecting others. And if you have a family circumstance where you have vulnerable people at home who are vulnerable to COVID, you can protect them by protecting yourself. And you can do that without uh, insulting or infringing on any other person's uh, uh, liabilities or... Ro- 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 I'd be really curious to. Ros, oh, yes, can, can I jump back in? in? Yes. Please do. I mean, I think I think one thing is that the, the evidence that lockdowns, etc., have actually been helpful um, is very lacking. There's a, a large study from the National Bureau of Economic Research in the U.S., which looked at 43 different countries and all the states in the U.S. and found that the shelter-in-place orders, or what we would call a stay-at-home order, have actually were associated with an increase in excess deaths. So you might gain a bit by having less COVID deaths in a short term, but all you did, as as Boris always saying about flatten the sombrero, was pushed it down the road a bit. And at the same time, you got more non-COVID deaths, which outweighed any benefit from reduction in COVID deaths. And apropos of masks, I would love to see any real world data that showed the sort of masks the general public are wearing and the way they're wearing them has any impact whatsoever on transmission. We've all seen people out, you know, I was taught to wear a mask at work. You wash your hands, you put on a mask, which was clean. You then held your hands like this. You did not touch your face. You did not touch your mask. After two or three hours in theater or however long you were there, you took your mask off. It went to a hospital laundry for a 60 degree wash. We see them out and about, you know, everybody's doing this. They're they're pulling them under their chins. They're wearing them on top of their heads. It is all it's been used for is a psychological tool of control. And the fear factor and the way Spy B have controlled are the data coming out, the daily deaths messaging. And the thing about now is that, yes, there are cases. Or are there cases? You, what you mean is positive tests, but it's not at all the same as a case. It's just a PCR test, which we know has had a vast um, a false positive rate. OK, let, let me, can what I just... what we need to know about only <coughs> is... You know, serious okay. hospital admissions due to COVID as I get, an illness, I get not that. people coming in. Ros, there's a lot in that. Julian, I don't know if you yes, can unpack all is. of that. But, <laughs> I mean, so let's start with the mask issue that Ros may uh, mention there. I mean, it's a fair point, isn't it? There's a lot of mask crimes that have been going on in the last year and a half. You'd be kicked out of medical school if you did what people did on the 520 to Paddington. You would indeed. Can you hear us, Julian? We've just lost Julian's line. Let's pick that up again with you, Roz, uh, as we try to get him back on this this point. I mean, people will say that there's not loads of unequivocal evidence for any of these things. But put together, then do they not all add up? Social distancing, masks, uh, ensuring that you don't have X amount of people too many in a certain establishment, all put together do have an impact. That, I think, is the argument against what you're saying. Yes, well, I think the argument is that if the vaccine's effective, put it whatever way you like, our death rate now, if you look at those graphs from last year, the death rate now is just a tiny little, you know, nine deaths here, ten deaths there. We're never going to get away from that. And if you ask people how many how many die every day of all causes? Most of the public have no yeah. idea. I think it's about fifteen hundred so or something, isn't it? Some, something, uh, my, yeah. something so of that we nature. Can... We have we have Julian back with us. Uh, oh, good, uh, Julian, okay. I don't know if you were Let's able to pick up most of what Ros was saying there. But there was a lot about masks and the uh, the inauthenticity of masks. What do you say to that? So there's lots of evidence to show that lockdowns work. There's lots of modelling to show that earlier lockdown could have saved you know, 40 to 80,000 lives. And there's a lot of evidence uh, from meta-analyses that masks actually do reduce infection, particularly in Southeast Asia, where 
you know, true world data shows that the epidemic curve of the COVID-19 pandemic has been much, much reduced compared to the Western European countries that didn't mask oh, yes. at the very beginning. That, yeah. So there are There's lots another of good reason. studies, oh, go on. lab studies, well, just hang on a sec, Ros, there are real world studies as well as lab studies showing the efficacy of masking and lockdowns as well. So um, I think we disagree on the evidence, and there's been a lot of this during the pandemic where the evidence is viewed in different ways by different people, and different people cite different evidence to support their own views. Uh, and I've been working in this field for 20 years in different countries around the world, different aerosol transmission and respiratory viruses, and I've seen the wide range of uh, exact, uh, evidence that have been, has been debated, like you know, RCTs for masking uh, is, is good and bad. In fact, I think RCTs is actually bad for masking in terms of evidence. Uh, mechanistic studies, modeling studies aren't good evidence, but in fact, I think that's untrue as well. So I think that the, the views of the experts actually differ on what actually constitutes evidence. And that's where the But you would, Julian, are, you would you would uh, acknowledge that the, the point that Ros has made, which was the clip we played of the new health secretary, that the that the damage for this, we're now at a point where it, th this needs a very serious conversation. You've got a huge wait, 7 million people waiting for procedures or whatever the figure was and all manner of other issues surrounding that. The fact that, you know, the death rates of COVID is still, you know, is very low. 1,500 people die every day. 10 people are dying of COVID. We've got to learn to live with this now and move on, haven't we? Of course. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I'm not disagreeing with you or Ross on that or the other experts on that. But I think what we have to do is, is look further ahead. So it's like a chess game where you're looking five moves ahead, not just one or two moves ahead. I'm concerned about winter coming with a reactivation of those uh, seasonal respiratory viruses in the absence of any COVID-19 restrictions. And I have collaborators in Australia and New Zealand that have shown that these respiratory viruses have disappeared, except for rhinovirus, over the last 12 months. But now they're reappearing uh, as paraflu RSV in Australia. And we may see that in the UK. And if flu comes yeah. back, on top of the rising yeah. COVID numbers... Ros, Ros COVID can you just number, respond briefly to that, if you could, Yes, Ros. I, I certainly can. I mean, I, as a paediatrician, I'm particularly worried about young children who have not had their normal... Uh, exposure to germs, which is part of the whole way that you build up an immune system, a broad, um, robust immune system against all dis all sorts of diseases. And I think we will suffer a bad winter, probably not necessarily from COVID, but from lots of other things to which we haven't been exposed. I've taken pleasure in being able to hug my snottiest grandchildren whenever I could, because to my mind, that's a vital part of maintaining my own healthy immune system. Ros, if you jumped on a bus uh, after the 19th of July, will you have a mask on? Oh, my God, no, definitely not. Julian, you're on the number 57 bus. Mask or no mask? Yeah. I wear a mask in supermarkets and on public transport. Um, Alfie, let's talk about the self-isolation rules for the double jabbed. Uh, to continue until August the 16th, the big problem is that um, Whitehall are worried now, civil servants are worried that people will just delete the app. What's your view about this situation? Well, I mean, I, you know, I think it's it's problematic. Um, it, in terms of, you know, you, we're creating a two-tier situation where some people have to isolate, others don't. There are clearly moral, ethical questions, questions of, of equity. But then, yeah, as, mm. you, as you say, there's a, there's a fundamental question over will this just, will this work at all? Will people delete the app. In fact, if you've got part of the population that no longer have to isolate if they're a contact, will those that we're now expecting to, to isolate still do so? I mean, it's very, very hard to enforce once you've got these uh, mixed rules of different parts of the population. And to be honest, I sort of feel like this is just a kind of a messy end to what has been quite a messy and weak policy from the beginning. You know, from the, yeah. from the start, we haven't put in place the support and infrastructure to make isolation work. And if you yeah. compare it to other countries where they put in place the payments and they put in place the support to keep people in their homes, they make hotels available, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We haven't done any of that and we're sort of ending the policy as it started. I agree with you. I agree with you on that, Alfie. I can't think, Emily, of a moment in this pandemic when the track and trace system actually worked. Well, no, and seeing as there's a large portion of the country who either never downloaded the app to begin with or have subsequently deleted it, um, it's probably just, well, the Department of Health is probably correct to uh, be thinking about the fact that people will simply delete it from now on. Because the problem is, it's not even the problem that whether it works or not. It just seems so utterly illogical right now to essentially force people to stay at home um, when they don't have COVID just because they've been pinged at some point, whether it's in an open air 
pub garden or whether it's at work or elsewhere and they've been pinged and they're forced to stay at home they can they can get a test they can be negative but they still have to take those 10 days out you've had kate middleton who was probably double vaxxed months ago being forced to spend 10 days isolated it just simply doesn't make sense at this stage and i think people are realizing that you know we can use our personal judgments for these situations and if the rules aren't logical and if there's this sort of one size fits all approach when it comes to the general public it's just not workable and i mean as you've said before in your show you know the adam smith institute has predicted that 1.7 million people per day could end up in self isolation many the vast majority of whom will not be testing positive at all and the knock on effect on people's social lives and of course the economy and businesses is just extraordinary i do wonder why on earth they're thinking about keeping this policy till mid-August. They should scrap it now, in my view. Yes, I wonder whether it should be disposed of. I wonder whether people will just vote with their feet, Alfie, and the government have got to actually own this situation again and accept that it just doesn't work. One big problem with this sort of protocol is that when cases are high, which they are, um, it's very difficult for this kind of system to actually make a difference. I mean, to be clear, although, you know, Emily and I are agreeing that the system isn't working properly, I think we're coming at it from quite different perspectives. You know, I'm not saying that it's a flawed concept or that it's not worth getting right. And here's what Emily's saying, we shouldn't be doing this at all. Well, with high cases, it is flawed, isn't it, Alfie? Because you've just got millions of people sat at home who've got no COVID. Well, there's a big problem at the moment insofar as the high cases, which we've let, uh, you know, get out of control, which makes isolation even tougher. But of course, the real challenge is that actually... You know, Emily's not quite right when she says someone that's double jabbed doesn't need to worry about this. If you look at a recent study from Israel, uh, two jabs of the Pfizer vaccine, which is, of course, a large proportion of our of our rollout, still allow is only 60 percent effective against reducing transmission. So, you know, four in four in 10 people with those jabs are susceptible to to have asymptomatic disease and be um, um, uh, you know, transmissible. So the, it, so actually the, the vaccine hasn't stopped this from being from transmitting. And of course, that's what we're seeing in the numbers and the situation we're seeing in terms of hospitals remains serious actually if you look at today the latest numbers 416 new admissions in england that's a rise of 70 percent that's an accelerating increase to put that in perspective if we stay on that course within three weeks we'll have 1600 new hospital admissions a day which is about half the first peak so we're, we're talking about a serious situation here now i really hope we don't get to that place Um, And I really hope that the vaccines end up pushing that curve down before we get there. But at the moment, we don't know. And so coming in and calling for, you know, to drop all efforts on isolation, to open up the economy fully, then hopefully there'll be a time for that very soon. But if we do it prematurely, we can end up costing everyone far, far more, both in terms of public health and the economy. Emily? That may be true, what you say about the disease still being able to spread, whether people are double vaccinated or not. But the issue is that it doesn't seem like our politicians, or at least there's an attempt to now, haven't been looking at the cost benefit analysis of these policies. If the only aim is to stop COVID cases from rising, then we'd continue in lockdown forever because COVID isn't going to go away. If we don't unlock entirely now, when's it going to be? In the autumn, the winter? Of course not. That's when cases will be up and and the NHS will be full of people with other respiratory diseases as well as COVID. You know, the, the whole point is that you need to look at things in a cost benefit analysis and think about the conflicting um, duties of government. And I don't know if you've seen, but the ONS have released stats that are showing immunity that nine in 10 adults in England, Wales and Northern Ireland now have antibodies. And that was in the week beginning 14th of June. So I suspect that has increased since. And, you know, anti antibody prevalence is also up among younger people. It's also massively up with those who are most vulnerable. So at some stage, the government has to, you know, balance the risk of COVID with absolutely everything else. And it's good to see that Sajid Javid is trying to do so and trying to, you know, be more practical than the pre- the former health secretary was perhaps. But I, I think, you know, you can't just only concentrate on COVID cases, firstly, because it will drive everyone completely bonkers, but also there's so much, so much else at stake. And what about the economic damage Alfie, of millions of people self-isolating, not contributing to the economy, businesses under pressure, medics in the NHS self-isolating because they've been pinged by the COVID app. I mean, soon half the country will be at home watching Netflix and baking banana bread. Well, you know, the economic trade-off 
um, only exists as a trade-off. But it's silly, um, isn't it? I mean, it's silly for four or five million people to be at home self-isolating at the tail end of a pandemic. Well, are we at the tail end? I mean, that's you know, that's that's the question. We all really hope we are, but in fact, by by letting letting the virus rip in the way we are, we may in fact be creating a type of situation which means we're going to fail. To well, there's under. a clear disconnect between hospitalizations and cases now, and the the health secretary has prepared the country for upwards of a hundred thousand cases a day, and we need to get away from the hysteria around cases because cases do not equate now with tragic COVID death. Well, I was talking about hospitalization, unfortunately. Those are numbers I was I was mentioning earlier. So we've seen we're seeing exponential rise in hospitalization. Well, in, cases in percentage terms, but we're still looking at pretty low numbers, Alfie, with all of the key vulnerable groups vaccinated. And if people are unlucky enough to go into hospital, predominantly they are people that have not had the jab and or younger people who will go to hospital, recover and go home. Exactly. So the but this is but this is where we're in the realm of where we want to look at the facts or where we want to speculate and be optimistic. I'm I'm with you, right? And so far as I really hope that is the picture we see. What the data is telling us. Would well, you not believe the... in the vaccine, Alfie? Does it not work? Are you an anti-vaxxer? No, have... You should go on a march, maybe. Absolutely not. In fact, I believe in it so much that I'm questioning why are we unlocking fully when we're in the middle hey? of a very successful vaccine. The vaccine model. works, but we shouldn't the, unlock. The, the I need some help with that. Point. Emily. The country... The, the crucial the, 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 point is that I'll come back we, to you, Alfie. Uh, Emily? We could wait to scrap restrictions until, you know, 100% of people in this country have antibodies. But that would mean, you know, that would mean we'd have to wait till the autumn or winter to unlock. And then there comes all the other pressures of, you know, the NHS at that time, which is always, always close to being But also, Emily, you'll never so vaccinate the whole, you'll never sentence. vaccinate the whole population. So this idea of people having 100% immunity is impossible because many people will not have the vaccine and that's their right. Well, exactly. It's, it's up to people whether they take the vaccination or not. And, you know, people understand the risks of, of the virus. They understand the trade-offs of having the vaccination. That's up to them. And it, it's true what Mark says when he says that People are, who are going into hospital now are much younger on the whole, and they are coming back out of hospital. The death rate is so, so much lower than it was. You know, we're not in a sort of Italy style scenario where people are, you know, overflowing out of beds in ICU units. It's just not the case. And I'm not sure exactly what people who are so, so cautious about this are really thinking because it's just totally illogical. There are so many other things going on in this country. Last word, um, last last word to Alfie Sterling. Thank you, Emily. I mean, Alfie, you are the chief economist at the New Economics Foundation, which is a revered organisation, and you know you know your onions when it comes to the economy. And are you not concerned about the impact on the economy of these ongoing restrictions and millions of people self isolating? Um, you know as well as I do, there is a clear link between damaging the economy and damaging lives and indeed costing lives. The University of Bristol told me six weeks ago on this programme that uh, upwards of half a million people will lose their lives because of the recession. So at the moment, the, you know, the single biggest risk to the recovery in economic terms is government policy. If you compare our situation to at the United States, for example, we've got about £90 billion in missing stimulus to get the economy moving again as we unlock. Now, that's £90 billion after you adjust for the difference in size between those economies. And if you want to break that down, it's not just like a big number in terms of just missing support the economy the government is giving. It comes in things like, you know, furlough ending fully with a cliff edge in September. So businesses can't transition to a post-COVID world. It comes in the form of the uplifting total credit being scrapped to loans being pulled back to the tax uh, uh, relief uh, being unwound, all prematurely compared to the US, compared to West Germany. These are the economic policies that are Costing. Alfie, Alfie, I, I don't think you should mention America. Florida, for example, unlocked five months ago and cases fell. No mask mandate. People are back in sports stadia and back to normal life. Yes. And my point is that even with that, the government is putting in greater economic support than in the UK. And that's precisely my point. They've, they've had a, a shallower impact from this pandemic um, overall across the country and some states much, much more so in the UK. And yet the Biden administration is putting in far more support compared to in the UK, where they've had a much more severe public health crisis, in part, actually, because we haven't listened to people that have been more cautious and asked to make sure that we don't uh, let this virus um, uh, uh, let rip in the way that time and time again, the optimists tend to always push 
um, for that to happen. And now, in addition to that, we haven't put in place the right economic support to well, secure I, the recovery. I, I'm very optimistic because I'm pro-vaccine and that's why we, I believe we must unlock. But Alfie, thank you for that. A really brief final comment from you, Emily, because I need to get to our next item. But your your closing thoughts. I was just going to say that private businesses are not calling out for more government support. They're calling out for COVID restrictions to be ended because they're looking at the situation that we now face and we're no longer in a crisis. By no calculation are we anymore at the height of a pandemic. It's simply not the case. You can talk about rising cases, but they simply don't translate to a high death rate. You know, we've had this vaccination. That's what was going to give us our freedom. The government needs to now take a, a brave and a well, um, you know, well calculated move and allow people to get back to their normal lives. 